Hello and welcome to the Shiny Bees podcast, a podcast for those who like their knitting comedy in yarn in equally large measures. I'm your host, Joe Milmine, and this is episode 131, how to get the most from attending a yarn show. I feel a need to laugh again with you, if that's all right. Hello, hello, and welcome into another episode of the podcast. How are you? I hope you're well and living the dream since last time I spoke to you and that you've had a good week. I'm excited to be back again. If you're a new listener, hello, welcome. I hope you enjoyed the show. And if you are back again, as always, I thank you every week because I'm grateful every week. Thank you so much for joining me again today. And in today's show, we're going to be talking about how to get the most from attending a yarn show. I talk about yarn shows a lot on the podcast and I do go to quite a few of them myself as I know a lot of you do and I've had the pleasure of meeting a lot of you at various yarn shows uh, over the years I've been doing the podcast and it's always really good fun. I really, 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 really love meeting listeners in real life. It's my favourite thing. So I can give you a good cuddle and say hello and actually see people face to face because I think that's just super important to me. I like to know the faces, the real people behind their avatars and um, social media profiles and just, you know, get kind of toe to toe with people. I enjoy that a lot. And of course, it means I get to have a little rifle through your knitting bag and see what you've got, what you're making, what you've bought and all that other good stuff. And as it's the beginning of the year and you're probably going to be starting to think about which shows you might want to attend and all that kind of good stuff. I thought now was a good time to be looking into this subject really in the hope that uh, there are a couple of tips there that I can help you out with from my experience. And also, of course, as always, I want to hear from you and what your top tips are so we can put together some kind of cool resource for people who've never been to yarn shows before so that they can, you know, they don't fall victim to the same calamities that maybe we have in the past uh yarn shows that we've attended because there are people who've never been so you know it's good it's good to help out our fellow knitter as far as news and all that kind of good stuff goes and thank you for everyone that has sent me messages about the community question for the podcast because I'm still working on where to host our community so we can all get together and chat I like to be the person that has the best party and I want to make it a great party for all of you and somewhere that everyone can come and chat and share ideas and basically create my kind of pub, my online pub, I guess, rather than hub where we can all come bring our knitting, enjoy each other's company and uh, learn from each other and share ideas and inspiration. So I've had quite a few different suggestions of places that I could do this and I'm still looking into all of them to be honest but I'm super super grateful for everyone that has sent them because some I'd heard of before but there were some that I hadn't even heard of just because I'm not in communities that already use that software. So I've got loads of stuff to go and look at and have a play around with to see what the best fit is for all of us. So I'm super grateful to all of you for sending in your suggestions. And if you do have any more, I am still working on it. So do just ping them through to me, info at shinybees.com. As promised as well, I'm going to be chatting about some of the feedback from the Trends for 2019 episode, which was episode 129. You can find that at shinybees.com forward slash 129 if you haven't heard it already. Um, that was where I gave basically my predictions for 2019, what I think is going to be big in the knitting world and what trends I, th- I think as a massive non-trendsetter, not at all trendsetter myself, just things that I think are going to happen or I think we're going to see. I have put that together in an episode in 129 and I asked all of you for some feedback and to let me know what you think and I have some to share with you as well. So I will do that first and then we will get into the tips and everything good about how to get the most from a yarn show. So grab your knitting, get a drink and we will crack on with the show. So the feedback I got was really interesting, actually, and I really enjoyed hearing from everyone who got in touch. I've picked out five different um, particular 
bit of feedback to share with you just around episode 129 and what trends I think are going to be big for 2019. If you want to join that conversation, at the moment the the community is still hanging around on Facebook and you can get there at shinybees.com forward slash community. Come and join in there or you can join in on the blog comments or send me an email or however else you find easiest to get in touch. So the first one was from Claire via the blog comments and she said, uh, two of your knitting trend predictions really struck a chord with me. Firstly, the Intarsia prediction. I attended a talk with Bristol Ivy at POMFest in 2017, at which she said it was her life's mission to bring back Intarsia. I think we need Bristol on the show. The popularity last year of Sue Stratford's vault sweater was a sign that Intarsia is on the up. I seem to see them everywhere on social media and at yarn shows, which is a good point. Um, if you are not familiar, I'll put a link in the show notes to that pattern and a picture, but it's basically got a big lightning bolt on the front of it. Uh, it looks quite 80s and it's very cool. Very cool. One of those kind of on the list to knit when I've got through my knitting jumpers list for 2014. <laughs> um, what else she says? Uh, she said the other prediction I completely identified with was buying less and knitting more from Stash. This episode came days after I'd announced to my BKFF that 2019 was the year I was going to plan my knitting projects using my Stash as my starting point rather than finding patterns and then buying lots of new yarn because the multiple single skins I already owned didn't add up to a sweater that I would want to wear unless I decide to adopt Timmy Mallet circa 1989 as my fashion muse which I've got no problem with. I quite like Timmy Mallet and I love the 80s. The prompt for me to make this decision was moving out of my house for five months over the summer whilst we underwent a huge building renovation project. All our belongings were packed away in storage and it was only when we moved back in and unpacked... <laughs> identifying with this massively, that I realised just how much yarn I had accumulated. It was the first time I'd seen it all out in one place and I was genuinely taken aback. I love my yarn collection and it's full of beautiful skeins so I have no guilt about what I've bought but I do think those gorgeous skeins need to be shown off in knitting projects and not hidden away in my storage baskets agree with that system. I also question whether I really need 35 pairs of hand knit socks from all the sock yarn. I have my own knitting prediction for 2019. Ooh, get into good stuff. I think we will see much more made of the connection between knitting and craft in general and our health and well-being. It's been talked about for a long time and knitters are very well aware of the positive effects our craft has on well-being. But I think this year we will see it much more in the mainstream, particularly as it has a natural link to greater consciousness about consumption, the environment and generally doing things which we feel good about. I like that prediction, Claire. I think um, you're probably right on that one. And I think as well, it's almost like a rallying against devices and electronics and the whole kind of internet stuff that's been so popular and growing for so long. People are start to talk, starting to talk about the joy of missing out and, you know, shutting off from social media and getting off the internet and back into the real world. And that kind of chimes in with what you said there as well about um, thinking about how you craft in general and making and using your hands. Uh, has a positive effect on our well-being. So thank you very much that, Claire. Uh, Lee Mitchell says, my trend predictions for 2019. Number one, I'm with you on the solid slash semi-solid colours. I don't dislike speckles, but I feel like I can't wear a heavily speckled sweater unless they are tonal or more subtle. The wild ones I can save for socks. Number two, I think the colourwork yoke trend will continue. I certainly hope so as I've not knit one yet. <laughs> Well, you can carry on making your own trend. Um, I just, I don't know whether it's kind of getting a bit saturated with very, very similar looking jumpers at the moment. Personally, I'm all for the Intarsia. Number three, as part of the novelty yarns and with spinning and weaving becoming more popular, I wonder if art yarn will become a big thing. I remember art yarn being a lot more of a thing when I came back to knitting in kind of 2011. So yeah, maybe adding that texture certainly seems to be a thing. I remember there was an uproar about hedgehog fibres bringing out a kind of paper-based um, art yarn type yarn last year. I got sent that a million times by people who were like, have you seen this? And certainly seeing more of the, albeit natural, like the mohairs and stuff being brought in to add texture and carried along with the luxury yarns or the workhorse yarns. I think you've got a bit of a point there. I think we might see a bit more of that. 
Next up, I have a comment from Annie Howard, who I was delighted to meet in real person. In real person. She is a real person, obviously, in real life, even at Yamporium. So she says, personally, I've always loved Intarsia. Big up, sister, as it opens up patterning possibilities. It's tricky when knitting in the round, which is one of the reasons it has lapsed in popularity, I guess, as we knit so much in the round nowadays compared to the 1980s. I think I'd have to agree with that one. Once again, shawls, I think wraps and long lacy scarves will take over from the triangle shape, but people will always want to wear something at the neck. I wonder if cowls are coming to the end of their life. Wow, bold statement there from Annie. I don't know about that. I don't know. I don't know if cowls are, but um, yeah, you might have a point. I think just the kind of thin tube, the one tube thing. I don't know. I don't know. I'm interested in your thoughts, guys. What do you think? Curls, yes or no? Let me know. Then we've got Neil Walk, who is an absolute terror blessing. He's awesome. Dead in Australia. And he says, big call on the shawl, you legend. I guess I will have to knit my mum something in the Intarsia method. And then left a picture of his mum wearing one of his shawls, which I think was Helen Stewart's uh, spin drift, looking at it, um, at the picture. So that's awesome. I'm sure, I'm sure your mum will like Intarsia as well, Neil. And then finally, I've got one from um, Katrine Vermeiren. I haven't checked if I'm pronouncing that, but I'm sure you would have corrected me if not. And she says, it seems I'm ahead of the trend with combining of single indie dyed skins with commercial quieter yarn. I love the highly variegated hand dyed skins, but it's too expensive and too much craziness to pull off a whole garment. I'm inclined to agree there. Also, the... Uh, only so much one skin hats curls and shawls one needs so I needed a different way to use up those precious skins and she's linked into some projects that I'll put into the show notes for you to go check out as well I agree with most of your trends and think that this will mean that another trend that will get bigger in 2019 is mini skins the ideal for mixing colors in stranded yokes which I think will continue in 2019 I think that's a valid shot I think you're you're right or combining with commercial yarn it's also good for keeping stash and budget in check while still allowing the buying new yarn thrill. I've seen them sold as gradient sets, which makes sense for the dyes over a big skin gradient yarn because it's easier to dye and more versatile to use in different kinds of projects. I predict a rise of designs like the Rainbow Relay Shawl from Jane Morrison. And Jane was on the show. I can't remember the number off my heart, but I will link in the show notes. I interviewed her fairly recently which are ideal to combine mini skins with a commercial yarn. I don't think Intarsia will make it. I can't believe you've said that to me. <laughs> because it is just too fiddly with the multiple balls of yarn needed at one time. I think people are moving away from overcomplicating things, like favouring more casual get-togethers over formal dinner parties, meal boxes, um, capsule wardrobes. In knitting, I've seen people move away from the more traditional techniques like seamed sweaters to knit in the round and from branding off or increases, decreases to short rows for shaping. And I feel Intarsia fits more with these, in inverted commas, older techniques. And that that chimes in with what um, Annie was saying there, Katrine. And I think you're right that like people don't have a lot of time and they, they don't have a lot of brain space often for coming up with um, the energy to, to do big, complicated projects. It's a bit more of a commitment and people are using knitting a lot more, certainly from what I'm seeing, as a way of chilling out and winding down and processing things in their brain and not necessarily as a massive technical challenge. Now, that might be because I don't talk a lot about about technical technical stuff on the podcast and so I don't see a lot of super technical knitting going on because that's just not again I don't do that kind of stuff um generally I want I need something that I can just pick up and not think and I think I think that's the same for a lot of people so it's interesting that you've both got a similar idea there so the, the, that's some of the feedback that I've had about episode 129. If you've not listened to that yet, you can go back and listen at shinybees.com forward slash 129. And if you've not commented yet, I'll let me know what you think. Then you can come over to the community and do that. Or you can comment on the blog post or you can send me an email info at shinybees.com. So that was fun. I enjoyed, very much enjoyed the conversation around that. I'll absolutely love hearing from people and hearing your experiences so I can learn from all of you as well. So now we're going to talk about how you can get the most out of a yarn show. Now I've been to quite a few 
and had mixed experiences. I've done quite daft things. I've done regrettable things and I've done some things that have made life a lot easier. And I thought it'd be a good opportunity at this point in the year to share some of those with you. As I said in the intro, for anyone who's thinking about and planning their Yarny outings for this year. Now, it's going to be a little bit different for me this year because obviously I'm not now based in the UK, I'm based elsewhere again, but I will be attending Edinburgh Yarn Festival. And that is always a great show, but it's very different to a lot of other shows. And depending on what you're wanting to get out of things, it's worth kind of, you know, working it backwards and figuring out what's your priority when it comes to going to a yarn show and what what do you want to get out of it? So you can pick the right one so you get the right experience because they all offer something slightly different. And there's no shortage these days, luckily for all of us, of yarn shows for you to go and attend across the country and indeed across the world. So the first place I want to direct you to are two different websites because the important kind of thing or one of the important factors that you will want to consider when you are planning which shows to attend is which shows are actually available and when they are. You might be limited by your calendar. So the first resource for you is for UK yarn events and it's written by travel knitter Larissa. I interviewed her on the show a couple of years ago now. Again, I will link to that episode in the show notes, but it's Larissa of Travel Knitter if you want to search it in iTunes. And she puts together every year a list of all of the UK based yarn shows with links out to all of the relevant websites. And this year she's added in quite a lot of new ones and she's actually annotated the newer shows as being new. So if you're wanting something a little bit different or a show that you've not been to before or you would like to show support to a new show, then you can identify which ones are new a lot more easily. The other place to get a more worldwide list of different places you can go, different retreats, different yarn shows is knittersreview.com. That's Clara Parks' website and that's got a fairly comprehensive list of shows across US, Canada, Australia, UK, Europe, Asia, everything, including uh, retreats. So if you're interested in the more knitting holiday type stuff, they're also covered on there. And if you do indeed run any events that would fit into either of those categories yourself, you can submit your event to Clara for in inclusion on the website. And that's done in data order. So that's quite easy to follow. Now there was another website called fibrevents.com and that came up higher in the search when I was looking for stuff, probably because it's called fiber events. Um, I'm not sure when that was last updated, but it's not in date order and it's not in alphabetical order. And actually at the bottom of the page, it says last updated in 2011. So I would definitely give that one a miss until it's more up to date. Clara's one is a better option at knittersreview.com. And I'll put links out to both of those in the show notes. So, I mean, I know a lot of my audience are UK based. So obviously you've got Larissa's list that is just UK focused, but as I'll talk about in a bit, um, if you want something a bit wider focus, you want to do a little bit of travel around your knitting and attending shows this year, then you can check out knittersreview.com and that will give you a list of all of that. So when it comes to the tips then for getting the most out of yarn shows, I would say number one is don't feel like you have to go to all of them. There is a lot of repetition between the shows and you will see a lot of the same people at shows all around the country. So if you don't go to a show, it's you're not going to be necessarily missing out completely. So first up, decide why are you going to be going? Do you want to go for shopping? Do you want to go for social? Are you going for work or to support your blog or podcast? All of those reasons are fine reasons for going to yarn shows. Um, but obviously you want to know which one of those is your reason before you choose. Otherwise, you're likely just to choose um, based on a whim or based on FOMO and not on actually making the most of your time and money when it comes to attending them. Because there are costs involved in attending yarn shows. They can be quite pricey depending on where you're going and for how long. Once you add in all of your travel, accommodation, your food, 
everything else, it can turn into quite a pricey endeavour. So you want to make sure that you're spending your money wisely on whichever shows you decide to go to. If you're going to be going for social reasons, think about who it is you want to see and which events lend themselves better to social gatherings. Some are better than others when it comes to getting together with other people. For example, um, Edinburgh Yarn Festival is very focused around having that social aspect and providing spaces and opportunities for people to connect and come together and meet their online friends and spend some time together alongside the shopping. Something like Yarndale doesn't lend itself very well to it. It's basically an agricultural auction mart. There's not a lot of seating. The areas get very busy where it is designated for food, etc. The aisles are thin, so you can't really stop and talk to people because it does tend to get quite crowded. Um, And if it's cold, right, it's absolutely freezing because it's skipped in. So you're not going to be sat outside. If the weather's good, happy days, you can go and sit outside and have a picnic. And I do that every time I go with uh, Linda and her mum Joyce, who have been listening to the show since the beginning, I go and have a picnic with them every time. But if it's cold, you're not going to want to be outside on the top of a hill in Skipton because it is Baltic when it's cold up there. So just think about what it is you want because the Yarndale has probably three times as many stalls as Edinburgh Yarn Festival because its focus is more on having more stalls than necessarily the social aspect and the kind of what I feel is a bit more of a rounded experience. Um, Also look at whether it's going to be a big venue or a small venue. The bigger venues might offer you more opportunity to stop and speak to people in the aisles. Um, If it's a quieter show, that might allow you more opportunity to do that. I used to really enjoy going to shows in the Highlands because they generally were quieter and they generally had stuff that you didn't get elsewhere because a lot of people won't travel that far north to get what they want and a lot of people from that area don't travel south so far because it's expensive and it's far so it's about looking at that whole picture of what you're looking to get out of it when you make that decision about which ones you want to go to if you're going to be going for shopping you might want to start to plan ahead no some people like to do things like save every two pound coin that they get so they've got a budget to spend when it comes around to going to the show which is a cool idea because it means the money's there you've saved it over the year you're not putting yourself into any kind of financial pressure on spur of the moment you know yarn purchase with the scent of wool in your nostrils you might make unwise decisions and (laughs) regret it afterwards if you've already saved up that budget in advance over the year you can spend that money guilt-free and you know you've got it and you know it's not affecting anything else so give that some consideration as well especially if you go into ones later in the year that's something you could start now and still have a nice budget to play with when you get there speaking about the budget as i've already kind of covered If you're going to go to a two or three or more day show, you're going to need a much bigger budget because you're going to be covering the cost of your accommodation and your food for that time and your yarn and your travel as well. So it's a much bigger commitment. And when you look at something like Edinburgh, which is like a sort of like four, five day show now, it's kind of, you know, got fringe events either side and all that kind of stuff, classes, which is another consideration. That's almost like a full holiday's cost by the time you've paid for all of your food and everything else, which is completely fine if, you know, you're prepared for that and you understand that's going to mean that you're not necessarily going somewhere else. But what you could also do if you have that kind of budget available to you is look at flying out to another show in Europe even and staying overnight one night. There's shows in Berlin, Barcelona, in Finland, Sweden, Norway, all of which, not forgetting Woolen, Dublin, of course, all of which are quite easy to get to on budget airlines. And actually the budget airline fares can be less than train fares in the UK. So if you've got a certain budget in mind and maybe you've been to a big show or a multi-day show in the UK already or, you know, wherever... You maybe think about how you could do something a bit different this year and use the same amount of money to go and do other shows 
and get a different experience perhaps. So think a bit outside the box of that. Also stuff like um, wool in from Manchester, it's an hour's flight. So you can get the first flight in the morning, go visit for the day, get the last flight back and avoid the accommodation costs. It is quite tiring because you'll have to be up early and Terminal 3 is brutal any time of the day, let me tell you. But it is another option if the budget is tight or you want to go and visit these places but don't necessarily want to be forking out 200 euro a night for a hotel. In terms of planning for when you get there then, so I think the important thing to say here is do some or you'll end up buying random stuff or something you didn't want or need on the spur of the moment. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but what it does mean is you are more likely to overspend or end up with stuff that you regret afterwards. And nobody wants the sinking feeling of regret when it comes to their yarn or their experiences around their yarn crafting. So definitely have a little think about what you want to be buying and doing when you get there. Think about what stuff you want to make, what's on your list, shop your stash by all means like we've already been talking about to see what's there and identify the gaps that can fill in with new purchases. You can add to stuff you've already got, maybe getting some of those commercial yarns to add to a nice um, hand dyed skin you've got, whatever you want to be doing. Think about what you want to make and make a list of all of the, the yarns that you're going to have to to acquire to do that make a note of the yardages and the weights for the projects that you've picked because depending on where you are you won't always have access to wi-fi which i know sounds ridiculous in 2019 but again stood on top of the hill in skipton like it's not easy to get wi-fi everywhere um, in the UK, we don't have great coverage, and um, particularly in rural areas, if you go into a show that's somewhere more rurally based. So make a list of all the stuff that you're going to need, yardages and weights, you know, get them on a printable. I can make a printable for you and write it down so it's available to you. You can whip it out your bag quickly, quickly check it without having to be like on your phone, you know, getting nudged when you're on your phone, trying to do stuff in the way, feeling awkward not having fast enough Wi-Fi because the Wi-Fi that is there is being hammered on people's, you know, card readers for taking payments, whatever. Have it available so you can quickly refer to it. What I would advise you do is research the vendor list before you go and make a priority routing, which sounds really clinical and not at all fun. But believe me, when you realise you've missed your favourite person completely because you just got carried away and didn't plan it, and got talking to people. Yes, I've done that. Um, or you end up buying stuff that you, you didn't want, or you don't end up with any money left to buy stuff that you really want afterwards because you've committed too early because you didn't go to the place you really wanted to go to. I've done all of those things. Um, you'll regret it like you will. And it's not worth it. So have a look at the vendor list and those people that you're super excited about going to see and make a priority routing. So you go to them first so you don't feel guilty afterwards. Talked about the budget earlier, but make one and have a contingency. So allow a contingency amount for random purchases because it's going to happen, right? And I don't want you to feel guilty about it. You're going to see something and you're going to be like, I have to have this and you're going to buy it. And that's fine. Don't feel guilty about it. We all do it. And if it makes you happy, then you get it. But what you, again, what you don't want to do is be like, oh, I spent way too much money and feeling bad about it afterwards. So make a contingency budget. I normally allow for about 20% and um, use that if there's anything that you weren't really planning or something random jumps out at you so that you can still have the enjoyment of getting it, but you're not going to be tripping yourself up and uh, feeling bad about it later on. In terms of social things then, because uh, I, especially recently, I've not been going to acquire yarn at yarn shows. It's been a lot for networking and seeing people and clients face to face. And it's also been a lot about social and seeing managing friends because it's a great opportunity to reconnect with people at several points through the year that you enjoy talking to online or that you spent time with at previous yarn shows and, you know, having a beer with them and having a great time. And yarn shows are really good for that social connection and bringing the online offline. 
So my number one thing for you when it comes to arranging the social so that you don't end up forgetting to see people is um, arrange to meet up with people in advance if you really want to see them. Don't say, oh, I'll see you there because you won't see them there. You won't because it's too busy. There's too many fumes. There's too many people and you get distracted and you won't see them and then you'll feel bad. So if you want to see someone, make an actual date and time and place to see them to make sure that you do it. Arrange lunch dates with people. Like I mentioned before, whenever I go to Yarndale and I always meet up with Joyce and (laughs) Joyce and Linda, who who, Linda um, is Joyce's daughter. Absolutely lovely. Joyce always brings me mini Jaffa cakes for our little pat lunch that we always have together. It's like our tradition. We've done it for about three years. And I know I'm always going to see them there. So I don't need to worry. Like I have lunch with them. That's our plan. That's what we do every time. And I know I'm definitely going to see them. So make plans, make coffee break times for with people. So you can go and make sure that you're hydrating, you're keeping your energy up, you're not getting too kind of strung out by the atmosphere and getting your blood sugar too low. Make a plan to have coffee with people that you really want to see because you'll have a nice sit down, you'll have half an hour with them and you'll definitely get to see them. Don't be afraid to leave the venue if it suits, if it's in an area that suits and go off site um, to get a bit of space and peace and quiet from the event and catch up with people at the same time. The event catering areas can be super busy. It can be difficult if the organisers haven't got a focus on making space for people to sit and spend time together. It can be difficult to, you know, sit down, you're in a big queue. The food isn't always that good anyway. Don't be frightened of going off site. You know, research the area before you go, find a nice little cafe or venue and arrange to meet there. So you get some time away from the crazy of the show and you get to spend time with people as well because shows can be quite overwhelming. I personally love them because I'm a people person and I go in and I kind of hoover up the energy of the room. Like I love just, I get really excited and animated and I love to be around people. So I really like being in a show because I enjoy that energy. But if you're a person that finds that hard or even just a not a mortal, to be honest, it can be super tiring and you do need time out to be able to reset and just have a little minute and just breathe and that's a good uh, opportunity to do that you can also look out for meetups with your favorite podcasters like me (laughs) I'm assuming I am if you're listening still and uh, quite often at shows we go to we will arrange the podcasters will arrange an opportunity for all of the listeners to meet up together and again that can be a good time just to say hello to people that you've listened to but also people you've had a conversation with within those podcast communities are also maybe going to be there so it's a good chance to make sure you see some of them And my favourite is to arrange evening activities if people are staying over or even better, Airbnb it and sleep over it up and have a big like knit night, especially if it's a couple of days shows. You might not want to go out every night. You might have had enough of of outside and you want to just like put your pyjamas on, take your bra off, get your knitting out, you know what I mean? Chill, drink some Prosecco in your jammies and this can reduce your accommodation costs as well. So if you have a group of people that you see often, get a massive B&B, have a party, throw a TV out the window, or, you know, just get in your jammies and drink Prosecco and knit. So that's another way that you can get your social time into the yarn show without missing out on seeing people. General tips then to round up this particular episode. So in general, my advice would be be a toddler. So take snacks and drinks and go to the toilet before you think you need it because the cues for snacks and drinks and toilets, depending on where you are, can be big and you just don't want to be, you don't want to be that person that really needs a wee. Make use of the bag check in the courtroom to shed any extra layers or stuff that you don't need safely and keep it out of your way. So you don't have to carry things, you don't get overheated and um, your arms and everything are free to look at and squish and enjoy the general products on offer. Layer your clothing. Temperature can vary wildly in yarn shows, depending on where they are. Again, using Yarndale as an example, in a morning when it's cold and it isn't full of people, it, it's it's pretty nippy. There's no heat in, so it is cold. But then once it gets full, it can get really hot, especially if it's sunny, it can get quite sweltering in there with all the people and the heat coming through the roof. So 
Make sure you layer your clothing so that you can adjust that as necessary to maintain an even temperature. It is tempting to wear every item of knitwear that you own and that is a valid approach but just be aware that it may lead to heat exhaustion if you don't manage all of that knitwear correctly. Take extra totes and bags for your purchases so that you've got nice solid stuff. A lot of people use paper bags now which is fine but they can rip so you don't want that emotional losing bits and pieces that you've bought and to be honest, more shows give you totes when you come in anywhere. You can buy totes. Just take a selection of those canvas ones. You can get them from most people and they fold up quite small and they're pretty sturdy. So they're going to be nice and safe. And finally, take an easy project to work on. You're going to be wanting to sit down and chat with your friends. You're going to be maybe in the pub and having a pint afterwards, sitting down, having some food, whatever. Make sure you've got a super easy project that you can work on. Fuss Free Festival Shawl by Louise Tilbrook is a pretty much a classic now, an easy, you know, it's a two row pattern repeat designed specifically for this purpose. Uh, Or take something that's just got acres of repeating one or two stitch projects, uh, not projects, one or two stitch rows that you don't have to think about. It's just repetition to build stuff up or everyone's favorite, a sock, Uh, just a tube sock, just knit that super small, super portable don't need to be looking at patterns and thinking about stuff. So they're my tips for attending a yarn show and making the most out of it and uh, thinking about how you can plan your year and your yarn show attending to get the best experience for the budget you've got and the time you've got available and what you're looking to achieve creatively and socially with your knitting this year. But I'm interested as always to hear from you because I would like to share all of your tips as well as we can get a really good resource going for how to get the most out of a yarn show. So if you have any thoughts, please do get in touch. You can come over to the show notes for this episode and leave a comment underneath those. That'll be at shinybees.com forward slash 131. You can email me info at shinybees.com or you can come over to the community shinybees.com forward slash community on Facebook and leave a comment underneath the post for this episode. So that's all I've got time for today. I hope you've enjoyed the show. I've enjoyed being back with you again and next week we are going to be welcoming the awesome Carol Feller of Stolen Stitches onto the show. I've got an interview with her coming up for you which I think you're going to really enjoy that talks all about uh, knitting, about teaching knitting, about learning different techniques and a lot about the business of knitting as well and about some early internet stuff which is really cool. I massively enjoyed the conversation with Carol and I'm looking forward to sharing that with you next week. But until then, have a wonderful week. Happy crafting and I'll speak to you all again soon. Cheers. You've been listening to the Shiny Bees podcast. Show notes for this episode are available at the website at shinybees.com forward slash 131. And if you want to make sure you get every episode of the podcast delivered directly to you, you can subscribe on iTunes or to the newsletter at shinybees.com. If that's all right. <laughs>